What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hey, good to see you. Hi, to, guys. Great to see you. So today we got an amazing guest that uh, transitioned from a life of public service into a life of public service. So uh, without further ado, Julie, please introduce today's guest. That's right, Chief. Today's guest served for 18 years in the Army, rising from private to captain for retiring in 2017. He is now the mayor of Manor, Texas, and has co-authored a book that helps service members transition to civilian life. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to the Honorable Dr. Larry Wallace, Jr. Hey, appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. And by all means, just call me Larry. You got it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Larry, for joining us. And everybody watching, you know what to do. Drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Leave your questions for Larry there. Um, we'll read those live. And if you're not following our page, you should. And you should also turn on your notifications. So that way you'll know all of our other terrific guests that we have lined up just exclusive to you. Awesome. So, man, Larry. Or the the honorable Larry, man. I, I like that. I like that title. Man. I, I'm about to use that when I get out the door. <laughs> but uh, Larry, thank you so much for joining us today, and we really appreciate you taking time to talk with us. Uh, can you can you let our viewers know where you're coming to us from? Yep, uh, as stated, out here in Maynard, Texas, is roughly about 13 miles right outside of Austin. So you come to Austin, you want to go towards Houston. You're gonna you're gonna go through us to be able to get there, uh, and, and that's where we are. So. Uh, right smack around everything, semi-pro, pro sports, the airport, just a nice, a nice, nice fitting area. So Texas is known for its barbecue in, in different places. Do y'all got a, a, a staple barbecue spot in Maine or Texas? No, no. You know, our city is still one of the, uh, the up and coming small town, rural, suburban cities. So it still has that home time, uh, 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 hometown appeal and feel. Uh, yes, we do have the fast foods and whatnot, but uh, I'll probably say 75% of our businesses are family owned. So you're, you're going to still get, even though you're not getting the, you know, the, 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 the barbecue place, you might have to go down to Austin for that, but it's still family owned. So it's still going to have its own appeal. Awesome. So Chief, there, it sounds like there's still time for you to set up your barbecue shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk See up. you there. We'll talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> But so. we do have a chuck wagon. We do have a chuck wagon that has some <gasps> great brisket. And oh, like thirteen ninety five, wow. you get the meat, you get the two sides, you get a drink, and you you walk away with a dessert. So I don't yeah. think we should sleep on the chuck wagon. This sounds great. Oh my gosh, see you for lunch. It's only a few hours. We can be there by dinner. That sounds really good. <laughs> Larry, you served for 18 years in the Army. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and then what led you to a life of service? Definitely. Uh, you know, early on college, I tried it out. It just wasn't for me. Just didn't, for whatever reason, have the aptitude at that time. Uh, and with a strong, strong talking from my father, I ended up going into the military. Uh, went in as a, originally as a 14 Tango Patriot missile launcher, and then I got shifted over to human resources. Out of the 18 and a half years, you know, early retirement, um, I probably did human resources for about seven at most. Uh, I've been as a specialist, you know, E4. I was the uh, uh, promotions board, the non-commissioned officer in charge for the 25th ID. Uh, went to go be a drill sergeant. Uh, uh, once I got commissioned, I was in charge of all of Southern Iraq's post offices and, and, and whatnot as a platoon leader. Uh, then I ended up deploying back to back with the infantry uh, where I served as administrative and logistics commander and a battle captain and a slew of other jobs at the same time. Uh, and then from there, I went over to NATO, where I was the deputy G2, G3 of operations and intelligence before taking command uh, of a company in NATO, supporting the, the land and the air commander. And then from there, I went to Fort Bragg, and uh, I was their last human uh, HR plans and operations uh, uh, division chief before going over to create their secretary of the general staff position and then retiring out as the deputy chief of staff for the Army Special Operations Aviation Command Airborne. That is one heck of a career, my goodness. <laughs> That's <laughs> so did, awesome. <laughs> but did you grow up in Maynard or did you, 
Did you grow up? Um, no, no, no. I, I, I born in Corpus Christi, Texas, right by the Gulf. Uh, was adopted at birth by my father, who was drafted from Vietnam, uh, and went down to Fort Sam for his training, the ear, nose, and throat. And I actually grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, so yeah, I ended up coming into the military from from Dallas Fort Worth. And uh, my dad's been living out here in Manor since about 2002. He helped set up the uh, the Travis County Healthcare Division here. And when I retired out, like all of us do, you're getting out, you don't necessarily know where to go. So you go where someone can actually help connect you to people, right? So you at least have a, a foot in the door to at least show what you can possibly be able to do. And so that's why I moved out here. Awesome. Excellent. And Larry, I'm sure during your time in the Army um, that you visited your fair share of PXs. That was a lot of places <laughs> and a lot of PXs, it sounds like. So what do you recall about the exchange during your service? Oh, always the food. Anthony's Pizza, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's Anthony's somebody pizza. else's favorite that's on this call. That's favorite, favorite spot. I, love it. I wasn't going to call her out, but... <laughs> <laughs> I love I love Anthony's. Yep. And I have no connection to the military other than working for the exchange. But whenever right. I run across one, I will try to stop at them because I think it's delicious. So glad of you're course. a supporter too. Of course. The, the big slice, the big slice, it usually has a lot of cheese on it. The the crust is good. That's when you know the pizza is good when you want to eat the crust too. Right. I know, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can get the large pizza. It's not that inex it's not that expensive, right? It's like ten ten dollars for a super large pizza. That in uh, Charlie's, Charlie's Philly cheese, uh, Philly steak. Those are the two places <laughs> I always went to for food. And uh, you know, other than that, uh, especially when I had my kids, you know, I had twins. I have twins, uh, uh, paternal oh, twins. Wow. And so it was going and getting the clothes where you can get them and they're not that expensive, but they still look nice, right? So I'm in there just shopping, buying a whole bunch of clothes. They're my first kids. So we all spend more than what we should <laughs> with our first kids. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned the value for military families that the exchange provides as we do really try hard to provide for military families who are doing all they can for us. So we have a, a great clothing great clothing price points and they're, they're good brands that hold up wash after wash so i'm really glad that you mentioned that that value that comes for families yeah hey, but i'm not glad that you mentioned all these food places because it's 11 o'clock and man i'm I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm like my stomach is growling right now and we, we keep talking about food man that's uh so so just to kind of transition a little bit larry you you uh co-wrote a book uh, to help service members prepare for life in the civilian world, which is super, super important because I think that um, kind of, you know, using my own self as an example, uh, all you do is, you know, when you decide that you're going to make uh, the military a career, you're just waiting on your time to reenlist again. And you don't really mm -hmm. think about the transition. Or and, and so now I'm at a point in my career where I got to start thinking about, okay, what do I want to do when I grow up? Because, uh, because you know, I'm on the tail end of my career. So, uh can you kind of, you know, tell us a little bit about the book and tell us what the most most important thing service members need to know okay. when they leave the military? Absolutely. So what I'll do, I'll show it to you. So this this is the book, The Transition, uh, Preparing for Financial Combat. And a lot of people believe it's how to deal with finances. And, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, in, in actuality, it's an aspect, uh, a psychological aspect of how you manage your transition will have a financial implication. Right. So how little prepared, how uh, uh, you don't assess and, and try to correlate things will have that impact. And you potentially are making bad decisions or making misdecisions because you just didn't take the pro proper time to analyze things. And so it's about 140 pages. The first 70 are pretty much what we call aha moments. I, I just wish I would have known it. The book is not written in any aspect where most books are written. And this is how I got to where I'm at. So follow me. And, and we really stayed away from that off of, I had a Brigadier General, one of the platoon leader that said this, he said, what got me to be a one star is not going to be the same things to get you to be a one star. And so here it's, it's an aspect of saying, hey, think of Murphy's Law when you're doing interviews. Noise is going to happen. These things are going to happen. So prepare, plan for that. Even when everybody's out the house, somebody's probably going to come in the house when you didn't expect it. Or when you're going and doing interviews, make sure you do some research and you're not wearing the competitor's colors or, or anything like that, right? Because uh, you just didn't know. 
um, you know, those types of things. So it's, it's about 70 pages of a lot of that and really saying your time in the military has set you up to be a great transition person. You know, we, we have the military career timeline. So go and develop your civilian one. Identify the different types of organizations and businesses and industries you want. And it may be 10 of them, but do the c- civilian timeline. Use LinkedIn, find out people, what, what are the prerequisite positions to get to this? What are the different types of certifications to get here? And then those 10 might dwindle down to actually two. You're willing to put the work ethic in. And you know you got to take a lower position or a lower pay or you have to go to school for a certain certification, but you know why, you know, instead of just kind of winging it. And a lot of us winged it when we were in the military, right? And so you don't want to wing it when you get out. So how do you utilize that? Um, In the last 70 pages are a whole bunch of resources. Um, When I served as the Director of Veteran Support and Leadership Programs for the University of Texas System, which, you know, is, is the largest in, in the state, is the uh, uh, second largest in the nation, uh, overseeing the 15 different campuses. I uh, had the opportunity of, and you may know our Sergeant Major is, um, uh, uh, Chief Master Sergeant is um, uh, Sergeant Major uh, Fleece Morell. She was the senior uh, uh, educating curriculum person for the U.S. Army Sergeant Majors Academy. And so I ended up working with her as their senior lead for a transition. Um, and in that was really, these are the different programs and resources, on-the-job training, entrepreneurship. Um, these are all the different ways you can use your GI Bill benefits. Similar to like if you're a teacher doing uh, uh, residencies or, or doing your hours in a classroom, we as service members, as veterans, have the ability to do that mixed studying in 50% in class, 50% on the job somewhere. That, that others don't have. And so the book really highlights a lot of these different things you, you have access to, whether it's four blocks, uh, whether it's, you know, a, 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 a different types of organizations that offer these internships, offer scholarships, um, you know, uh, the Department of Labor's uh, expansion on uh, apprenticeships and, and so forth. So the book is more of a resource because I hated having to run into the person that knew the information to make me realize, I wish I would have known that like last semester <laughs> or, or a year ago. Yeah, no. So the, uh, I always tell, you know, my service members, man, the, the military sets you up with a really good foundation to uh, for leadership and, and just different types of things. Now, you just have to take that and, uh, and really apply it to life because uh, you can apply that in the military and you can apply it to civilian life. The stuff that we mm-hmm. learn at our, our NCO academies and all this other stuff, uh, you know, outside world is paying top dollar to train their their folks and we're getting that you know essentially uh, as a part of being in the military so just you know utilizing those skill sets and then knowing where the resources at that's that's just more you know knowing where the resources and then apply that those those uh, that skill set and those concepts that you learn in the military into the civilian world you, you'll, you'll be successful and i'm saying that oh, yeah. prior to, i haven't been in the civilian <laughs> world but uh I, I can assume i've talked to a lot of people that have transitioned uh and, and got a lot of good nuggets from them no, definitely. You know, the, the, the unfortunate thing in, in the whole piece of it is with 200,000 individuals transitioning every year, you had 200,000 are transitioning the year before and the year before that. So when you're coming out, you're competing not just with the other, you know, 199,999, but the previous years. And then all the veterans that are in positions looking for jobs and then all the civilians that are looking for jobs. So how are you leaning forward enough to really be able to say, you know, even though I'm 11 or Bravo, 11 Bravo, and people say I'm just kicking in the doors, that I'm really learning attention to detail, that when I kick in that door and it happens to be dark, I know where the first man, per, first person, second person, third person, muzzle awareness, if a flashbang goes off, I'm able to assess the situation. Like that attention to detail and that quick analysis, that's worth something. Mm-hmm. But it, unless you take the time to really sit back and say, even though I'm 11 Bravo and you're 11 Bravo, even though I'm a human resources person and you're a human resources person, if I was not in that job, the way I think, the way I did things, the way I engage with people, what value or what would have to be done if I wasn't there? The job still had to be done, but the way I went about it, how did I do that? And that's usually the piece where a lot of us, when we transition, we don't know who we are because we, ha- we haven't taken that time to take the uniform off and really assess 
where we help the organization day one by coming in with our certain personalities. And transitioning to civilian life has worked out well for you. Uh, you're the mayor, as we talked about, of Manor, Texas, just outside of Austin, one of the fastest growing suburbs in the nation. What called you to, to a life of civic leadership <laughs> after military leadership? <laughs> well, I moved my, my wife and kids here, so uh, I don't want to <laughs> hear them saying, uh, you brought us here? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so it, was, it was a little bit of that, but also just getting out and you know, not knowing anything and I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a home buddy right I, I'm good to stay at home so uh unless I'm engaged in stuff I don't necessarily know what's going on with you know people come visit I don't know where to take them uh those types of things so a lot of the people I connected with early on said hey if you want to know what's going on with the city you want to know how it's growing what it's going to have what it's not and so forth get on planning and zoning so I got on planning and zoning I did that for about eight months and I just felt like I want to do more in city hall was just kind of like, yeah, but that's not your job. You know, you do this, council does this, we do this. And I'm like, ah, I'm not feeling it. And so I decided to go ahead and run for city council. I ended up winning and getting on city council as a council member. And I was like, this feels like being back as an executive officer or, or a commander. I can get involved in everything. I can ask everybody everything. You know, people can come to me and I can go there. I can just get in it all, right? And I enjoyed it. And uh, our, our position for mayor opened up and uh, I really had to make the decision. Do I step down nine months in as a council member to run for mayor? And I made a decision and said, look, if I, if I really am doing this to better the city, to better the livelihood for, for my family and now others, um, then, then what am I saying by just sitting back to build time and an additional credibility for, to run for the position, right? And knowing, as you said, we're the seventh fastest growing suburb in America. Uh, and then, you know, one of the 20th best small suburbs to live in America. Um, and so with all that growth, really saying my experiences in NATO and special operations and so forth, uh, having the contacts I did have, not knowing anything governmental wise, um, you know, if anything, I can at least bring contacts and resources and at least help in decision making and lean on my city manager, chief of police and so forth and end up winning. And then we had COVID and we had snowvid and we had threats of violence. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really quickly it, it, it came to see that the leadership aspect that I thought I could bring to the table really ended up being the significant factor in how our community was taken care of versus a lot of the other ones around us. Yeah, I, I can definitely see the correlation, especially like emergency management and, and, and different skill sets you learn as far as critical thinking, uh, put in contingency situations, you've been deployed a few times. So just, you know, having all the experience, I can see how they can help a, a city during during COVID and, and all these different w weird situations we've had in the past year and a half. A right place, right time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> nice. yep. Congratulations. That's great. No, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. You know, the interesting thing was when 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 COVID first started, the first thing that came to my mind was, all right, we're if I'm on a FOB, right? If I'm on a forward operating base and we get cut off by all resources. Um, so I started planning healthcare, food, you know, those different things. And you know, that that 30 days of COVID is gonna be around turned into what? Yeah, <laughs> um, <no>. so, <laughs> exactly. so it, hey, it was a benefit. It was a benefit. Well, and speaking of COVID-19, you know, the pandemic, it presented huge challenges for all of us, including civic leaders. So uh, you talked about how, you know, you changed uh, to fit in with it. But what has this last year taught you about leadership? And then um, has it changed how you lead at all? I think it reinforces my concept of leadership, honestly, uh, you know, my background and my experience, luckily, I'm able to be a little bit more candid uh, than, than some of my other fellow elected officials. Uh, and to come to find out that the community just love this the straightforwardness, right? Get rid of the political jargon, get rid of the, the tiptoe, tap dancing, finger pointing, all that stuff. And then say, look, hey, we dropped the ball on that. One. We're, we're, we're coming to you, right? Uh, or this is what we're going to do. This is what we can't do. And this is why, you know, be upset. 
but be upset for this region and, and, and for, for this occasion in, in these entities, right? And here's our part of the blame for it, but here, here are the other ones as well. Um, you know, it also makes me think of the piece of, there's a lot of people that look at you and, and see things in you that you don't see. But then in this time too, I would say, there's also a reverse that a lot of us have. We feel that we can do something that other people just don't necessarily understand. In my experience, even though I retired as a junior officer, as a captain, my experiences in working with general officers and you know whatnot and all those different capacities, I felt that I was able to do more than just the normal. Here's your rank. This is your lane type of a thing. Uh, in you know, with the unfortunate circumstances of this past two years, uh, what I felt I could do. Uh, I think it was demonstrated and shown and the things I learned from my unique military career service was of great benefit to ensuring the 40,000 people in and around my city. Yeah. And, and you know what? I love the word candid uh, in the military because I, I know what that means. Candid normally is followed by like four letter words and all kind of other stuff all kind of <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that happen when, when stuff doesn't go right. So, I love the I love the use of the word candid when it comes to the military because I can automatically go back to a candid moment or something <laughs> with me, uh, when, when I screw up. So that that's that's a good word. So I, I, I learned how to clean that up. I learned. Yeah, how to yeah clean absolutely, that up. man. Listen, <laughs> you, you are you are all polished up now. You that book is all shiny. <laughs> So uh, we, you got a super captive audience today. You got soldiers, airmen, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members joining us on, on the live today. What words of inspiration or hope do you have for the military community? You know, honestly, I would say this, you know, go out and do the broadening assignments. Do, do what you can and, and, and assess where you want to be post-military while you're still in. So you can utilize your military career to set you up for that transition. I think a lot of us, we get so focused into the assignment to get promoted that we forget to also make the assignments to get the experience, to, 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 to get the training, to get the credentials that we'll also need when we transition to go into that next phase that we wanna do. And even though you might've come in in a career field that may not necessarily align with where you wanna go, how do you still pick an assignment to where you can do the training? You can you can do the broadening assignments or have the 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 eyes on exposure opportunities to start gaining some of that knowledge and some of that wisdom. So you shorten that gap when you do make the transition. Excellent advice. Um, thanks for those words. So Larry, before we wrap up, want to pause just for a second and share some comments from our live viewers. So um, Army Family and MWR programs, um, probably know them as Army MWR. Uh, mm -hmm. They say, hi, exchange team. We are sharing this interview on our page. Thanks, Larry, for your military service and continued service as mayor. All right. I, I love the NWR. I don't know how many trips I've done, especially over in Europe. Yeah. I, I wish we had one local other than Fort Hood, which is like 45 minutes away. So. And then Emily Hill says, I would definitely pass that book on to my son. Uh, so informative. He's Army. Um, and So informative and specific. Uh, and then I believe that somebody said, they, Carol says, what book at Emily I hopped on after it was mentioned. So Larry, if you wouldn't mind uh, popping that book back up so Carol can get okay. a view of that. Definitely. It's the transition, preparing for financial combat. And uh, I think we're finalizing uh, the, 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 the um, getting it listed on a fees to be in the to be in the stores. I know uh, before COVID happened, we had already did the contract and whatnot. So I'm looking forward to hopefully by the end of this year, we actually have the books on on the shelves uh, within within the exchange. Love it. <laughs> yeah, def definitely. And, and like I said, um, it, and you you mentioned some words when you were uh, kind of giving some words of inspiration to our military community. But um, I think no matter what your job is in the military, there's 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 points of, of of your training or where you learn different uh, things that, that can translate. You just have to look at it from a different lens when you're applying it to a different job or whatever the case may be. So 
uh, like I said, even for, for me as a young Marine, when I first came in, uh, I was like, how is this job going to translate to anything that I want to do on the outside world? But then I got a chance to really just kind of break down what I actually did and how I got to that point or to from A to Z and just applied it differently. But but the same skills and, and same because just, just like going to college. So I go to college and I'm, they have these fancy words for exactly what I just did yesterday yeah, at work. Yeah. And I'm just like, OK, this is the fancy word for what I just did at work. And, and but I'm learn, I've already learned this kind of essentially already by doing it. But now I'm I'm going to college and learning the fancy word that's behind mm -hmm. the action I just took. So uh, yeah, just you know, I'm glad you uh, you you made a, you you created you know something for our service members to use uh, as they transition into civilian life because we're all going to transition at some point. And it's awesome that we got folks out there that are really trying to take a, take care of us on the other side already. So we appreciate you for that. No, I appreciate it. And, you know, definitely I understand what you're talking about, where for us, we call it military decision making process. And you go you go to a business school and they're going to say SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, yeah. opportunities, you know, or they're going to say Porter's five forces. What are the influencers and so forth? And that's why I say, again, that's the key part of depending upon what industry you want to go into, starting to have that time and use that year or two years before you get out to start understanding the terminology Absolutely. and you'll start seeing how quickly you're already doing that stuff. Yeah. They just think you don't know it because you're not using the right language. And you know, the other key piece is 80% of our nation has no association or affiliation with the military. So whenever you do your resumes, whenever you're talking and doing interviews, first ask if they have any military, military uh, affiliation or association, but then also always realize only 20% at any given time has any connective tissue to the military. Yep. Great, great nuggets. And we appreciate you. So Larry, we appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Uh, great insight. Uh, definitely looking forward to checking out the book. Uh, thank you for your service. First and foremost, just, you know, you know, doing 18 years or I mean, doing any time in the military is a commitment in itself. And, and, and for you to do, uh, you know, uh, a very, very, you know, outstanding <laughs> career is worth of, of, you know, being associated with the military is just, you know, just thank you for that. And thank you for kind of blazing the trail for folks like me that are still in, uh, but also blazing a trail to, to make sure that we transition out the right way. Uh, but this means so much to all of our, our military audience and we wish you all the best going forward. And we're going to have to check out this chuck wagon uh, down in Maine, <laughs> Texas with this brisket. Cause <laughs> oh yeah, so, it's good. It, it stays on your hands, man. <laughs> Don't wear a white shirt. Don't wear a white shirt. Uh, so me and Julie, <laughs> we're, we're headed down to uh, Fort Sam Houston from Dallas. We're going to stop in Maine, Texas, and check out this chug wagon. I'm sorry. All why right. wait? What are you doing right now? <laughs> I'm in the uh, let's go, let's go, guys. I'm yeah, hungry. My, my stomach is not going to hold out for two hours, two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> Get a snack. Hold on. Get a snack. Oh, and yeah. then you'll Both be good. Snacks, and then we'll go and we're going to the chuck wagon. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Thanks for the invite. Well, Larry, thank you so much. And we wish you well going forward. And uh, Chief Chat out. <laughs>